Peace family, my name is Danielle and the owner of Ellie B's Body and Skin Care. All of our body butters are natural and handmade. All of our ingredients, they're unrefined, they're not GMO, and they're without chemical irritants. You can reach me on TikTok, IG, Facebook, or you can visit our website at Ellie B's Body and Skin Care. And I truly hope to hear from you guys soon. Peace. This video is brought to you by the book Revelations Unsealed by Minister Emmanuel Solomon. His work has identified the dragon in the book of Revelations and will change the way you look at the world. Revelations Unsealed is available on Amazon.com. Peace. I'm your brother Crumb. Go to Chakra Doctor TV on YouTube, subscribe, and tell them that the master student sent you. And while you're there, ask about Miracle Food and My FCA Yoga. Crumb. TV. Thank you everyone for tuning into another informative video here on the Information Age. Today, family, we have a great debate. My brother Prodigy versus Zerubbabel. Okay. The debate title is The Origins of the Ankh. And I have two special guests here, okay? Special judges. And the first person I'm gonna introduce is my brother, this guy, I watched him from going live on his Facebook page, okay? Dropping the information to now he has a great thriving platform where he is bringing you the information, guys. He's your favorite racist. You know him from <laughs> damn Gina. <laughs> My good brother Crumb, the master student, okay? And this the second guest that I'm going to, I'm sorry, judge, that I'm going to introduce you guys. If you conscious and awake, you have watched Sonetta TV, okay? This guy has been banging hard on from the Hebrew Israelites to the Christians, okay? This guy was born into comedic science, okay? Most people say, hey, I'm gonna study this, but a lot of people doesn't know that his mother was a was a big part of the um, comedic information here on this soil. OK, um, everybody know um, Dr. Henry Clark and different ones. But what they don't know is the brother Shaka Upmost mother. OK, was was very vital in that movement. Mm -hmm. So without further ado. My brother, who brought you the expose of King James, <laughs> Shaka up most. Okay. Denise, where are you? I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, y'all. So, today we have Zerubel Judah and Prodigy Voorhees on the origins of the Ankh. They're going to do two 12 minute rounds. And then it's going to be a question um, segment where it's three questions. The person gets two minutes to um, reply to the questions. Um, do, they, do the debaters want to introduce or do you just want to go straight into the debate? Uh, we can in introduce, man, because I, I want to give my premise. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So we was already, you know, already in, in Ampu Crew. We was in a discussion, and the brother, as soon as I said, nah, that represented a damn penis and a damn uh, uh, a uterus. He said, nah, nigga, I, I'll debate you on that. This is why we're here. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, Prodigy, did you want to say anything? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, I, I want to give a shout out to uh, the panel. Definitely, uh, Sister uh, Ivy, uh, uh, Denise, uh, Shock. I see you on uh, the brother Crumb. First time meeting you. My name is Prodigy Voorhees, man. I'm tapping in all the way from Compton, California. I uh, definitely want to give a shout out to the Ampu Crew team, my aunt. Um, The reason why we're having this debate tonight. Um, because my opponent, which is a uh, self-proclaimed Hebrew Israelite, he's under the assumption that the origin of the unk is a penis and a vagina. He's stating claim that the original meaning that the ancient Egyptians, uh, the whole point of the unk being created 
was of a wound, a penis, and a vagina. I, of course, I have a opposing view, and I'm here to state my claim. Um, so definitely want to, uh, I'm definitely ready um, for this debate. So let's get it cracking. Okay, um, so Ruben Bell, you were supposed to go first. All right. So, uh, let me get, hold on, let's get your time together. The timekeeper, me, 12 minutes. Oh, and okay. shout out to um, Shaka Amos and the brother, um, um, uh, the brother, thank you, man. Appreciate that. All right. Okay, your time will start when you just start. All right, so we know. The aunt, you know, it's also look. These are not my words. Oh, can I ask who's speaking? Uh, who's speaking? This is Ruba Bell right now. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure because we got the Hebrew Israelite on on, on point. Yeah, right. it's it's the Hebrew Israelite. All right. right? Cool. All right. So the aunt, the okay. Egyptian crow, so called, right. also known as the aunt, was originally the Egyptian hieroglyph used to represent the word life. And anybody that's got the um. Uh, what's that book? It's the it's the book, man. It's it's got all all the hieroglyphs of the ump, and it does say life, right? Mm -hmm. All right, all right. By extension, this cross became primarily a symbol of life. Mm -hmm. All right. The verb ump means to live. It also refers back to live, live or life. Okay. There's no doubt about that. Yet, there is no way to justify the translation of its uh, participle as living or alive. Where it occurs, the god Thoth registers King Pepe above the Anku. And we all know what that's, yeah. yeah. Text of Pepe the First, utterance 469. 964F on the on the um on the um on the on the charts. Um is a part of being the epithet of the gods that we use for being. My bad. Sorry. All right. Now, additionally, onks were traditionally placed in sarcophagi and ensured life after death now we all know how the egyptians figured after death right we all know you know they they tried to figure that you know once you die you still have a life after death that's why you see all these unks around the um around around the, um the, the um the um the coffins. That's why you see all this. Because the Ankh shows similarities of the Knight of Isis. Some speculate that Ankh and the Knight of Isis represents the same thing. An intricate bow. Other theories claim that the Ankh could signify a cohesion of heaven and earth. Interlinking male and female symbols. Or could ceremonially girdles the ankh is one of the most recognized symbols from ancient egypt known as the key to life we all know the ankh is the key to life we all know if you even if you read in the in the um in the dictionary of the um the middle kingdom it still says the ankh is the kingdom is is a key to life it still represents life you know what i'm saying and dating from the early dynastic period from 3150 to 2613 it is a cross with a loop at the top sometimes ornament with symbols and decorative decorative flourishes most often simply and plain gold cross it is an egyptian an egyptian hieroglyph symbol for life we can't really get around the fact that they, they they thought of it as life that's it it is a it's it's a word life all right 
Now, hieroglyphic symbol for life or breath of life, the Ankh, and the hierog the Egyptian believes that er that one's early journey was only part of of an eternal life. We all know they believed in the damn the afterlife. They they did. I'm surprised that cats ain't really chasing the afterlife. I'm surprised. But they do believe in the afterlife. Well, I'll say they did. You know, carried by a multitude of the Egyptian gods of tombs, paintings, inscriptions worn by the Egyptians as an amulet. You know, they, 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 they believed in this. You know what I'm saying? The Ankh only means life. There is no way around it. And I'm not trying to be too short with my time, but you know, but that's that's exactly what the hell they believe. Or at least, or at least our master teachers in the Egyptian spirituality believe that. And that's what they teach. And don't forget, I'm an Israelite. It ain't about me, but I'm just saying. This is what our people, our elders, teach, right? Okay, so I'm gonna keep it short with that man, and I'm gonna let this brother go on here and spill his spill, man. Zerubbabel, before I get into my presentation, brother, let's not forget the reason why we're here to debate. You made the statement and the claim that the unk, the origin of the unk, was a penis and a vagina. You failed miserably to do that off the dribble very very bad presentation brother if you are trying to prove indeed that the unk is a penis and a vagina so let's get into my presentation okay. what is the meaning can you go on on uh, mute brother please thank you oh, i got you i got you bro okay what is the meaning of the unk symbol a woman's womb a man's phallus or the key of life the eternal breath etc etc all right since the 1960s amongst the black conscious community there has been a notation that the unk originally represented a woman's womb vagina and a man's phallus this ideology is rooted in conjecture and speculation sadly my opponent has fell victim to what we call in academia a bandwagon fallacy the bandwagon fallacy describes believing something is true or acceptable only because it is popular belief also it is called appeal to popularity which is a logical fallacy that is based on the assumption that something must be true or good if it's in accordance with the opinions of others it is extremely common error and can be committed either unintentionally or on purpose. And unfortunately, my opponent has done this to himself on purpose. But today he will be corrected, rejected and edified. Let's move on to the next slide. This is a book called Temples of the African Gods by Michael and Johan Haney. And what blew my mind about this book is that on page six, it has this image of a petroglyph of the sun. And what do you see in the middle of the sun? The unk. So let's look down and read the description at the bottom. It says, first recorded unk, petroglyph of Southern Africa. Let's go more into this information. It says on page six of the book, Temples of the African Gods, we see the first recorded petroglyph inscription of what we recognize today as the Unk, which has been found in South Africa. As you can see, the Unk symbol is inside of the sun glyph. The Unk is inside of the sun because the sun gives life. The sun radiates light and heat or solar energy, which makes it possible for life to exist on Earth. It's obvious that this first recorded inscription of the Unk has absolutely nothing to do with the female wound or the man's phallus. So by default, this debate is over. 
if my opponent can't show a depiction of a unk that represents the male and female reproductive organs before this petroglyph, then this debate is over. But since I'm in a good mood and I feel like burying another Hebrew Israelite, let's move on with the presentation. Zerubbabel, you see what's on the screen? Is this where you're getting your methodology from? This is called a new age common hypothesis. The comedic womb of mankind and eternal life. See, you see these memes all across social media. You see it on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. It, it, it's just a, 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 a fluctuation of these kind of memes that's describing new age hypothesis. You see here the loop at the top. They claim it's a uterus. These two things sticking out on the side, they claim it's the sunset and the sunrise or the fallopian tubes. The vertical piece hanging down, they claim this is either a phallus or a vaginal canal. Let's look to the right. It says the true mystery of the unk revealed, the male and female reproductive organs combined. This is a new age common hypothesis. The ancient Egyptians did not teach that. So if they didn't teach it, then where did it come from? Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to a amateur mythologist by the name of Thomas Inman. Let's go into a little bit of information why he is known on record as being the first person in history to claim that the unk was indeed a vagina and a penis. Let's read it. It says Thomas Inman, an amateur mythologist in the 19th century, believed the unk represented the male and female reproductive organs joined into a single symbol. In 1869, Thomas Inman published ancient pagan and modern Christian symbolism. He interpreted the loop of the unk handle as a female's vagina and the three prongs of the cross as a male's phallus, together forming a union that suggested fertility. Thomas Emmon drew his conclusion by suggesting that all mythology started with phallus worship. This is where it comes from. Zerubbabel, why didn't you tell us this is your master teacher? This is where you're getting it from. Nowhere in ancient Kemet can you find, especially in a language where the unk is associated with the phallus or the vagina? Let's take a look in this book. It's called Ancient Pagan and Modern Christian Symbolism on page eight. In this depiction, Thomas Emmon decided to anthropomorphize this figure into the symbol of the unk. The right side is male. The left side is female. Now pay attention to the unk symbol right here, right here. The reason why it's turned sideways is because the vertical part of the unk is on the right side of the male representing the phallus. The loop part of the unk is on the left side of the female representing the vagina. This is what you call a logical fallacy that was created by Zerubbabel's master teacher who was a amateur mythologist named Thomas Emmon. He wasn't even an Egyptologist. So this is what we do. Let's get into the language. Let's get into the language, right? Now, what I'm using right here is the Mark Vigas Hieroglyphic Dictionary. As you can see here, we see the glyph for the penis is right here. And the glyph at the bottom is the flesh. Zerubbabel, there's no unk right here in the depiction of the penis. Where is it? You claim that the unk was a penis. Here's the glyph here. There's no unk. Let's go to the next slide. Right? Zerubbabel. These are the glyphs for the vagina, the private parts. We see the raised arms, the bread loaf, and the flesh symbol. There's no unk here, Zerubbabel. Also, we see right here, vagina, vulva. Vulva is the lips on the vagina or the outer flesh of the vagina. Zerubbabel, there's no unk here. So how are you stating claim that the origin of the unk is a penis 
and a vagina or a womb, and we see no unk in the language, right? So let's go to the next slide. This is the glyph for the womb and the uterus. You see this right here, what I got highlighted? This is the uterus. This symbol is the flesh. There's no unk here. Zerubbabel, I thought you said the womb on the unk or the loop part was the womb or the vagina. Why there's no unk symbol here? Because it's not associated with the uterus. So let's go deep into this, right? Let me let me uh, go back out a little bit, right? So these are the glyphs um, for the vagina and the private parts, right? So this is a depiction in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs that means vagina, private parts, or wound, and the word is cot. So now if you pay attention, there are three glyphs and not one unk symbol in sight. Now, if you look at the top, we see the raised arms. We see the raised arms, which is biliteral. And that glyph represents two consonants, and those two consonants represent the K. And after the K, you see what we call a diacritic three. We also have the letter T, which is represented by the raised bread loaf. The bread loaf is a monoliteral representing the letter T. Now, this last glyph is what is called a determinative. And these determinative glyphs help determine the meaning of the word. These determinate glyphs usually come at the end of words like we see here in these particular glyphs. So this picture is the actual depiction, uh, a depiction of a birth canal, not the vertical line at the bottom of an unk. You see how it tapers over to the left and to the right and then it curls. Them curls is representing the ovaries. We have the fallopian tubes curling into the ovaries. This is not an unk. This is the birth canal. This is the vagina. This is the womb. There's not an unk in sight. This picture is the depiction of a female womb, not the unk. Zerubbabel, you have some explaining to do. So by Zerubbabel's logic, by him claiming that the unk is a vagina, a womb, and a penis, if we are dealing with his methodology based upon the, the metunature, the language, then this is what the unk should look like. A woman's womb and a man's phallus doesn't look like a unk to me. If we was basing the unk off of the language, because you can't get a full overstanding on the symbolism if you don't know the language. So according to the language and the ideology, of my opponent, Zerubbabel, a woman's womb, this is the glyph, and a man's phallus, that is the glyph. According to him, this is what the unk should look like. And we all know this ain't the unk. Anybody that reads any glyphs or any, in, in any of the metanetta knows that a man's phallus does not mean penis. It means copulate. It does. So I don't know what he's trying to convey and his fucking, his fucking damn premise, he's not making any sense. It really literally means copulate. It does not mean male penis. It doesn't. There's no way around that, man. Now, now, so you, you can try, you can try that shit again, man, if you want to. So. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna get one of your elders in the meaning of the unk. This is one of his elders. Yes, we see it. All right, all right, so I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna let him talk. He gonna say a whole bunch of stuff. We're calling it the unk man. And this divine sign, this is the, the um, preeminent sign of the African spiritual high culture because it honors, first of all, the mother, the womb. It honors the father and the synthesis, the children that comes from the womb through the seed of the father. It also symbolizes the water that rises up from the earth. Up to now he's saying a lot, but he is specifically saying, this is the womb, this is the fall. 
Okay. I'll, I'll even let that. I'll even let him continue, man. To the clouds, falling back on the earth as rain to bring vegetation out of the ground. It also is spirit, mind, and matter. So, however you look at Ankh, it shows the continuous, uh, continuous regeneration of the life force. Now, when the Romans um, adopted Christianity in order to co-opt it, now this is not nothing that no Israelites made up. This is for this is from comedics, uterus, womb of life, sunset, sunrise, fallopian tubes. Why would you want to wear fallopian tubes around your neck? Why would you want to do that? And it's it comes down to say but the vaginal canal. Who 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 wants this, man? Who wants this? Is this what we doing now? Come on. We can't be doing this. So you can't sit there and say, oh, we don't believe this, but yet and still y'all run around and, and this is what y'all damn repeat. Okay? If you want to change it today, you can change it goddamn today. Even back, even back here, the Ankh is one of the most recognized symbols of Egypt. Of Egypt, we all we all know it's Kemet. We cool, we can rock with that. Known as the Key of Life, of the Cross of Life, whatever they want to call it, and dating from the early dynastic period. This this goes back to the fucking that first first dynasty, right? We can go all the way back to the first dynasty. They've been recognizing this. This damn unk shit forever. It even says, hey, the origin of the unk is on the, the origin. Egyptologist Sir Alan Gardner, 1879 to 1973 CE, thought it developed from a sandal strap. We know that's bullshit, right? With the top loop going around one's ankle and the vertical post attached to a sole at the toes. Gardner came to this conclusion because the Egyptian word for sandal was unk, but that is not life. That in that that in that knock, that's not knock. It's not. It's not life. You know what I'm saying. And I will get into that into that the jib, but I already see that my homeboy is not on that. And the cult of uh, Osiris. Became the most popular in Egypt until until the cult of Isis, which told the same story and promised the same rewards, dominated it. Osiris continued to be greatly admired, but in in time became a secondary character in the story of this resurrection and rebirth. She was not the fucking damn same one that came up with that fucking unk, man. I don't even know if it's really worth getting getting into it, man. I don't know. Oh, I know what I did want to share. I'm, I'll share this with you. Yeah. We all know of Ishtar, right? From Babylon, right? We all know about Ishtar from Babylon. And she even has the same, those same rings that are on the top of the fucking unk. She has those. Look at all this. Goes way back to Babylon. Let me get something I can read to you. Ishtar had a significant impact on the images and cults of many later later goddesses. What later goddesses would she have an impact on? Like Ma'at. Ma'at was a goddess. Isis was a goddess, right? Many goddesses from the classical period, as such as Aphrodite, uh, Artemis, Athena. From being a being a most commonly attested of ancient Mesopotamia de deity, she had fallen into almost complete obscurity. Ishtar slides into modern day anomaly, likely likely resulted into resulted from a variety uh, a variety of causes, but can be mostly plausible to a dis disappearance of cuneiform systems. Two hours. minutes. Okay, 300 years. I can't believe I went that long. All right, 3,000 years. Cuneiform was the primary reason for the 
communication throughout the ancient Near East into parts of the uh, Mediterranean. It fell into use around 400 BC, although the process involved involved in this change remained uh, ignomalic. Ishtar's influence in the influence in the ancient world subsided alongside the script used to recur, record her myths. So they they knew about these type of shit. They knew about goddess of uh, fertility. You know what I'm saying? They knew about this. If you look up the definition of piss poor scholarship, I'm pretty sure you will see the picture of Zerubbabel with his screen turned off right next to it. This is horrible. Um, and really, it's a waste of my time, but it's cool because at least I get a chance to edify the people. Um, he just brought up Ishtar, claiming that um, the rod and ring symbol that Ishtar is holding, I guess he was trying to insinuate that this is where the unk comes from. Well, let's see if that's true. It says the rod and ring symbol is a symbol that is depicted on Mesopotamian steles, cylinder seals and reliefs. It is held by a god or goddess and in most cases is being offered to a king who is standing, often making a sacrifice or otherwise showing respect. The symbol dates from the third dynasty of Ur to the Neo-Assyrian period. So the first time these rod and ring symbols pop up in Mesopotamia is in the third dynasty of Ur. Hmm. So when we deal with chronology, when was the third dynasty of Ur? It says the third dynasty of Ur, also called the Neo-Sumerian Empire, refers to a 22nd and 21st century BCE ruling dynasty. Zerubbabel, the Unk dates back all the way to, um, to what? Uh, maybe about 800 years before this, eight eight to 900 years. Matter of fact, let's go right here. It says the Unk, pre well, I'm not even going to go into the ice, it's not. But when we look at the Unk, it's, it's dated at the first dynasty, 30th to 29th century BCE. The rod and ring symbols of Ishtar goes back to the 22nd and 21st century BCE, the unk predates the rod and ring symbols that we find on Ishtar and Ur. The unk couldn't have come from that, sir. So really, uh, I'm not here to talk about the rod and ring symbols. I just wanted to address that because, of course, I can go into the cartouche and show the rod and ring symbols on the bird in ancient Kemet of where actually the Sumerians got that from. But let's continue on with my presentation, right? So it says here, the meaning of the Ankh symbol. Let's keep it moving. It says here, we see Akhenaten and Nefertiti reverencing the sun god Aten. We see the Ankh in Akhenaten's hand and Aten shining the rays of Ankhs upon the Pharaoh. Zerubbabel, I have a quick question. If we go by your methodology, are you saying that the sun god Aten is shining down rays of vaginas and penises on a pharaoh Akhenaten? Because this is what you teach, right? The unk is a vagina and a penis. So is this what you're stating claim? That Aten is shining down rays of penises and vaginas. Okay. Zerubbabel, another question. If you're going to use the methodology of a Eurocentric teacher, which I have no problems with because information is information, um, why would you use an amateur mythologist like Thomas Inman? Why didn't you use somebody like Alan Gardner? At least he claims that the unk was a sandal strap because of illustrations on middle kingdom coffins and they resemble the hieroglyph and he argued that the sign originally represented the rope the rope the rope the rope is very significant 
because the rope means to bind and we're going to get into that right so it says garden a list of hieroglyph signs labels and the unk as s34 let's keep it moving let's go into the language which my opponent chose not to do he just went on random websites and didn't actually get into the language of the actual ancient egyptians right so let's go here let's look at the language the unk sandal strap unk Amera, let me edify the people right quick. The unk just does not mean life or living. There's various things that's attached to the word unk, just not life or living. Like we see here, sandal strap, mera. We see the unk symbol right here. To live, be alive, swear, to make a oath. When you make an oath, you're binding yourself to something by making a oath with your words. This is why the unk was also uh, associated with the rope. We see here the unk is also associated with the living. Let's keep it moving. Right here, we see the unk being associated with a captive or a prisoner of war. Why is that? Why would the unk be associated with a captive or prisoner of war? Because you see this image, this person right here, he's a captive. He's a prisoner and his arms is binded by rope. There goes that word binding again when it comes to the unk. We see the word here, captive. The eye, the eye right here is also associated with the unk. Goat, small cattle associated with unk. Ear, goat, billy goat, the living. Goat, small cattle, all associated with the word unk. Even here, we see unk to live. The unk is also associated with the beetle. The unk is also associated with the. There's many terminologies that the unk is associated with, depending on the context of what you're talking about. We see the unk here, the sun. This is why we see the sun shining the rays of the unks on Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Zerubbabel. Those were not penises and vaginas. Brother, you got to step your scholarship up. You have to step your scholarship up, right? So let's keep it moving. All right, so let me back up out of this right quick. All right, fit the screen. All right, so now what I want to talk about here on the screen is the unk can also be symbolic to the human anatomy. This is the thoracic, if I'm saying it correctly, complex of the human body right here. As you can see, the unk is symbolic to the thoracic depiction of the human skeletal system. Let's take a look over here on the right, right? If you take a look at this depiction, we have the unk. And this right here is what is called the dejed pillar or the spinal cord of Osar or Osiris. And this here is called the wasp scepter, which was carried by the Netzeru, the pharaohs, and the priests. So these four columns you see right here, one, two, three, four, these horizontal columns is the spinal cord. And here is the loop around the neck. You see here on, on, on this side of the human skeletal, we have the spinal cord. Look at the loop around the neck on the skeletal. It looks like an unk, huh? Doesn't it? So these two pieces sticking out would be the collarbones. Look at that. This is the sternum right here in the middle. What is the job of the thoracic system? It's there to protect your lungs. And what do the lungs do? The lungs give you the breath of life. So this is why the unk is symbolic of the human body. Now, let's see how the Netzeru dealt with the unk in ancient Egypt. Zerubbabel, we see Ampu here holding the unk up to the nose of a king, giving him the breath of life. Zerubbabel, are you saying that this is a vagina and a penis? Are you stating claim that Ampu was holding a vagina and a penis to, to the nose of the king 
given him everlasting life, the breath of life. When we look at more depictions, we see the unk being held to the nose. Look at Hather holding the unk to the nose of this sister, giving her everlasting life. It's not over. Look at this. Tahuti holding the unk to the nose. This is not a vagina and a penis. Zerubbabel, you are getting that hypothesis and false information from Thomas Iman, your master teacher who is an amateur mythologist. Here we go again. It don't stop. The unk being held to the nose, giving the kings and the pharaohs everlasting life. Two minutes. Right? So... The Egyptian unk are not necessarily what you think it means standing alone, but how the Egyptians used it in their texts and illustrations. The most common depiction of the unk is being clenched in the hand of by the gods and the goddesses on the upper loop portion of the symbol. The unk appears frequently in Egyptian tomb paintings and other art, often at the fingertips of a god or goddess in images that represent the deities of the afterlife confirming the gift of life on the dead. In other words, the Egyptians believed that their gods held eternal life in their hands. Zerubbabel, the reason why you're at a disadvantage in this debate is because you're a Hebrew Israelite. So your methodology just based off of that alone is why you're at a disadvantage when you try to speak on a culture are we, uh, hold on that, what are we doing right now sir, what are we doing sir you're interrupting my time can you go on mute please thank you zerubbabel you are trying to cross over into information that's too complex for you to overstand because you are a Bible believer. See, the Bible says, don't get tossed to and fro by different winds of doctrine. Don't get to read, don't, don't, don't get to dibbling and dabbling and other. See, when you're a Bible believer and you do that and you try to cross over, especially into Kemet, this is where you are going to fail miserably because you don't do comparative studies or textual criticism. You don't go in depth with the studies and it shows by your scholarship and your methodology. The unk is not a penis. It is not a vagina. That is not the original meaning. I went into the language and showed you that the unk is not associated with the uterus, the vagina or the penis or the phallus. I also showed you where Zerubbabel is getting his information from when it comes to the unk being a vagina and a penis from this amateur myth uh, mythologist right here by the name of Thomas. It's other. It's not it's me. It's time. Zerubbabel, right. you're interrupting no, me. But your time, your time was just up. But okay. you can't get okay. that. Okay. Like what okay. the heck? So is it correct that that? That people in the comedic faith believe that the onk is a, a yoni and a damn phallus, man. <laughs> a pussy uh, and a dick, man, for real. So um I, I just I just I just want to respond by saying that I'm, I'm I'm taking this debate very serious. I don't know why you're laughing and heckling. That's not what I'm here for, brother. Um if if you believe, hey, that's, that's cool. Just ask bro, me brother, can you question, not man. interrupt my answer, Ron? I have two minutes, sir. If you need more time to ask your question, then I'll go on mute. So let's have some decorum, brother. Are you ready for me to answer? Yes or no? Okay, cool. So to answer your question, the burden of proof was on you to show that you're asking me did the ancient egyptians believe that if you believe that they believe that you would have showed that tonight but you prove my premise that the unk was indeed one, one of the 
major things that the unk was associated with was life which you kept proving over and over again so if you can't prove it why are you asking me sir Zerubbabel, my question to you is this can you show me anywhere um before 1869 any historian any scholar even any um ancient egyptians when we go into the language i mean you can even use manitho if you want to can you show me any ancient historian or scholar who claimed that the origin of the unk was a penis and a vagina before 1869 no, nah, it always go it all it goes all the way back to Dan Emmett. Yeah, Thomas and okay. Yeah, so Emmett. yeah, okay, yeah. okay. I'm not so gonna you lie right. to you. Hold on, oh, hold okay. on. Go ahead, bro. I'm brother. not gonna lie to you, but I'm saying this is the premise that a lot of cats have in in the comedic community. They do, right? Uh, absolutely, brother. So I just want to say thank you for sitting here admitting that the hypothesis. Of the unk being a penis and a vagina goes back to Thomas Inman. You just yeah. admitted that. So by default, brother, by default, you lost the the, the debate because you said it was the Egyptians no, 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 who no, taught no, that. No, no, but you no, just admitted that it was Thomas Inman. So thank I, you. Bro. I, I appreciate all, that. My whole premise. The no. only thing that I was saying. The whole premise was that. A lot of comedic cats teach that. And I proved it by showing you Baba Haru teaching that. That's it. Prodigy. Does the uh does the so-called onk not represent life? Yes, one 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 of the meanings, like I showed when I went to the glyphs with something you didn't do. Yes, one of the meanings is life. The onk means a plethora of things. It just doesn't yeah. mean life. So yes, one one of the things that it does mean is life absolutely can you show me um anywhere in the actual glyphs um the unk being associated with a phallus a penis um a uterus or a vagina can you actually demonstrate that to everyone here can you show us the unk well we do oh, well, okay with That's that great, according, great, great question i'm not finished brother <laughs> okay have some decorum thank you so can you demonstrate that by going into the language and showing us how the unk is associated with the penis, the uterus, the vagina, um, or the phallus? Can you demonstrate that, sir? No, I can't demonstrate that. But we do know that the knot of Isis is also related to the unk. And that is back, um, back when they said that they had to do that for... Um, Put the rag in for menstruation. That is the knot of Isis. This is a Egyptologist named uh, Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. We uh, all know this, as, <laughs> sir. Can I have my two minutes uninterrupted, I'm please, not, brother? Can I'm you give me Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So let me start my two minutes over again. It says, Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. It says the theory of Egyptologist E. A. Wallace Budge, who started studying in Egyptian language in 1883, claims the unk originated from the belt buckle of the goddess isis his theory is considered probable but still not universally accepted wallace budge equated the unk with the egyptian symbol tet the knot of isis a ceremonial girdle thought to represent female genitalia and symbolizing fertility the problem that i have with this information is that he says the unk originated from the belt buckle of the goddess Isis. How is that true when the unk predates the tit or the knot of Isis by over 400 years? The unk is dated to the first dynasty. The first time we see what is called the knot of Isis or the blood of Isis showing up in the third dynasty. So how can the unk come from the knot of Isis, when the unk predates the knot of Isis by over 400 years, tracing back to the first dynasty. Also, it says here, it says the tit first appears in Egyptian iconog um, 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 iconography 
in the third dynasty it was frequently used in association with the dejed pillar of osiris it says also called the blood of isis the tit represent menstrual blood some say yeah. the amulet okay. is shaped it's brother okay. i'm not finished the amulet is shaped like the cloth worn by women during ministration others have interpreted as a representation of a ritual tampon that can be inserted in the vagina to prevent miscarriage just like we see isis making sure that she protected heru when she was when she was pregnant with heru and we all know how that story with dylan would set so but, a minute. so just let me finish this off the unk does not come from the knot of Isis. It actually predates the knot of Isis. So E.A. Wallace, Budge, and Zeruba Bell was wrong on that point. We can get into the panel. I want to first and foremost put some respect on the channel, the Information Age. Shout out to y'all doing a wonderful job. Uh, second to the listening audience, shout out to everybody uh, who's listening now and for all those who are going to catch this later. I just want to put this out there, family. Smash that like button, family. Come on, tap in. It's been nothing but straight fire, pressure, and heat this whole hour. So put some respect on the energy, the information, and everything that's been put out by hitting that like button. Also hit that subscribe button. Um, so yeah, with that said, I want to give a, a big shout out to both of the uh, debaters, y'all, y'all. This is this has been the first time I've I've experienced anything like this. I kind of we just do adding value on my side, but I love this. You know, iron sharpens iron, and I love to see the brothers do the the warrior thing. Uh, you know, lions roar, and, that, and that's what I, I expect. And both of the brothers did that. So uh, within that realm, both of them came to the heat. Um, now, for me to bring the other side of it, because the feedback model is to provide you know positive feedback first. Uh, with that said, I believe that uh, Voorhees was very well prepared. He stuck uh, to the PowerPoint. I did have an issue with his mic in the beginning. He fixed that. Um, he stated his position in the very beginning. In a debate, I'm not even a professional debater, but we have to state, you know, uh, whatever our position is initially. The first brother Hebrew Israelite, uh, uh, um, Shalom, he didn't state his his position in the beginning. I was a little dissatisfied with that as I wasn't clear what his argument was. He didn't clarify that. Uh, Voorhees did. Shout out to him on that. Voorhees was very well prepared. Um, I've been on both sides of the coin. I've been um, in a situation where I wasn't well prepared and I was pulling for all all places and I was even though I knew where I was going I, I I appeared all over the place not to say the brother was all over the place but he appeared that way um at least in comparison to Voorhees Voorhees was very well prepared with each and every one of, one of his points last point uh that really uh pushed me over the line was the decorum I I don't like the debate part because you know um the stereotypical black people just ah, 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 ah it's just you know chaotic uh, so the, the 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 decorum piece for me is essential if I'm going to partake in, in it because I don't want it to be with all due respect niggerish, um, and uh, that was the part that uh, I don't think he was trying to be like that. I just know that we as a people tend to go in that direction, and I saw it. However minuscule it was, it did come off that way. So my uh vote unanimously or on, on both rounds and the q a goes to prodigy Voorhees. peace and love to the brother first and foremost i would like to give my respect to the information age um denise and ivory scales two wonderful ladies who are trailblazing the way shout out to you too um i could be heard correct yes thank okay you. I, I i don't i don't know if print was saying raise the roof or or, or raise Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest here. Um, Prodigy Voorhees has shown a, a, um, a level of scholarship, but not only the scholarship, it's the methodology in which he is disseminating his information. So me as a listener, it was clear in what he was trying to prove. I believe that he covered that, but not only that, he had room for his rebuttals and responses, and it satisfied me. The other brother, um, you appear to become deflated and that's okay. All of this is a learning experience. And until you encounter somebody else with a better methodology, you don't know what you need to fix and critique. 
So I give you my respect and my love, and I tell you to keep grinding. Prodigy 4, he's hand down. First of all, give thanks for Information Age, doing a great job. I mean, I definitely appreciate this here. This was wonderful, you know, energizing. I mean, I was tuned in like this was a sports event. So definitely want to say everyone is doing a good job here for us to start off. Um, as far as the information itself, Project, I think, did a great job. Um, it's probably one of the first time I've seen where a person is not only going to start off with their standpoint, give information, and also give information for the other person. <laughs> I mean, the dude covered the whole thing. He actually helped the guy with the information at the same time. You know, the information that he didn't have. I mean, I, I had I, no questions. I was 100% satisfied. I've never seen that before in my life. I was 100% satisfied with it. I mean, it's, to me, it's prodigy all the way. I think that everyone watching, uh, if they're honest within themselves and if they're just objectively, uh, if they're ob objective thinkers, they would be forced to admit loudly uh, and in a very clear voice, unmistakably, that uh, Prodigy Voorhees um, committed a Friday the 13th massacre in this debate. And uh, and it, you really couldn't even call it a debate. Uh, it, it just wasn't a debate. Um, it's kind of like, I just want to give you a quick analogy. Uh, first of all, I am I can just tell from the comments by some of the people uh, commenting that I'm certainly not the smartest person in here. I'm certainly not the most intelligent or well-informed or, or educated person in this environment. So I'm privileged and honored just to be in, just to be here with everyone who's here. Um, that said, uh, it's kind of like someone who only understands uh, arithmetic trying to have an argument with someone who's talking about calculus. And then I'm looking at the comments of people telling uh, uh, Jerusalem, I think it's his name, uh, people people who are telling him that he did a good job, that's like a chorus of people who only understand arithmetic commenting on a debate between someone who teaches calculus and someone who only understand who barely understands arithmetic. It, it well, this was not a debate. A debate means you have two people who are actually engaged in scholarship who agree on the larger picture, but there are uh, minute distinctions that may not be so minute that they have points of contention with. And that's when the knowledge is pulled out. This was not a debate. This was a class given by Prodigy Voorhees. And I was very honored and privileged to be a student in that class. And, um, and that's just the truth of the matter. And I don't say this in any... Uh, I'm not trying to be mean spirited in any way. I'm just a very forthright, honest person, and uh, and and I also I'm not saying this with any bias, um, because uh, truthfully, there was one thing that uh, uh, Jerusalem said that I thought was interesting. And I always teach people a really good debater, a, a really good a, 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 a teacher, even if you want to say that, can argue the point from both sides. And if, in other words, if you're really good, you can argue. Jerusalem's point if you're really good if you're really good you can argue uh uh, uh Voorhees point but you don't have to be really good to argue Voorhees because Voorhees point was just, it was uh uh so well done it just it stands on its own merit I know that some people didn't particularly care for his methodology I can't complain because like I said I'm probably the least scholarly person present here right um I just I just study you know I just I do what I can do and I think that's what all of us uh uh, uh try to do but um prodigy really really committed a friday the 13th massacre let me give you give you something and this is not to be mean-spirited but it's to point something out right and it's going to sound mean-spirited but i really just want to highlight this because it's something that stood out to me and it's where we sometimes have to move our ego out of the way and just accept things as they are and i'm going to leave it at that because it's not my lecture um i noticed that uh jerusalem i think is his name he had very he had very very serious problems with pronouncing 
very, very basic words. He couldn't pronounce, he couldn't read correctly the word an anonymity. He had problems with grade school words like variety. And what I'm saying is that if you're talking about scholarship and your literacy level is that compromised, then you might want to um, move your ego to the side, your religious ego to the side, and spend more time educating yourself on the basics, like just reading and reading comprehension so that you genuinely understand what it is that you're reading, which will then reinforce any premises or arguments that you may have. But it was a very uneven, if this was MMA, the first round, there was no need for a second round. There was no need for a third round. It was it was over from you know from the beginning. So that's just my perspective. Um, the details speak for themselves. I don't really think I have to go back through. I don't think I don't think that I have to go back. Hold on, Zeru. Hold on, Zeru. Let him finish. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm not saying anything that I'm saying in order for uh, uh, either side to agree with me. I don't have any dog in the race. I look. The comedic community doesn't really care for me for the most part because I quite often go against what they say. Right. In other words, I, I don't believe in. I'm not an apologist, and I don't care for people who are apologists because they're putting their opinions before the facts. And the only thing that uh, uh, Voorhees came with was documented facts. A large part of the problem that I had with uh, Jerusalem was he, from the very beginning, he showed no sources. He just started reading. There were no authoritative references, and I now. I'm a person, I commit logical fallacies all the time, but I believe in committing logical fallacies for a good cause. Like I will appeal to authority in a heartbeat. Why? Because at the end of the day, when you send your children to school and your tax money is paying for teachers, you're paying for their authority, not for them to be correct, not for them to be, uh, not for them to show veracity, but simply because they are purportedly an authority on what they're teaching. So I, order, yeah, absolutely. I'll commit a, I'll, I will commit a logical fallacy in a heartbeat if it's for a good cause. Because at the end of the day, you have to consider the people who are on the other, who are on the other end of you teaching. They came to learn, right? They came to learn. They didn't come for you to be perfect. They came to learn. At the end of the day, what it is that they know, they will have to take the ultimate responsibility for that. Not you, not Jerusalem or even Prodigy Voorhees. It's each person in earshot, right? Even this um this clown you have in the audience uh who calls him a Calfani. Uh uh uh, uh yeah, he knows who he is, right? So and I don't normally use language like that, but I was just looking at some of the comments being made and I was just wondering where some of the um uh some of the poor uh uh uh, uh demeanors are coming from. I thought you know, I, you know this is the information age you this this is the information age platform. I think it's awesome. I'm so uh, uh, privileged to um, to be here, and you know, and that's it. You know, yeah, I certainly do appeal to um, authority all the time. I commit logical fallacies all the time. Why? Because at the end of the day, um, uh, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, the evidence has the last word. It's not you. It's not me. It's not anybody else it's the evidence and i think that enough people saw enough evidence to know who actually won this um massacre of, of a debate and that's my perspective could i just mention real quick i must be transparent prior to this debate i was under the impression that the unk represented the vagina and the penis and when he and he said there are a lot of people that are, are, are under that impression i was one of those people he referenced so i don't want to say anything other than Voorhees would have Friday the 13th me if I was in a debate right now with him with him he would have got me because the, I was under the, I would have never went on the debate but I want to say it as well at the end of the day I'm the master student um, and I submit to the authority as well uh, I, I want to add as well too um I definitely have some thoughts on that as well, but I also know there's always uh, a corner part to everything. So while one of the things definitely was stand out, and I like what he did, he talked about the esoteric, he talked about the, the, the origin pattern and how we have made a physical corner part to it, which the physical never trumped the original part to it, which is the actual essence of what it stands for and sometimes people of course take information and create their own thing but you always go back to the essence and the essence gonna trump 
what somebody else feel what it is. So I definitely appreciate that, how he put that in place and straight from the, from the gate. And I'm like, wow, this guy got it. I mean, and some things I did not know. So he taught me some things with that as well. And I'm like, this is amazing. You know, like, I, I, I love this. I'm sure it's frustrating for uh, a lot of people uh, in any community to be lumped in with everyone in their community. So let's just use the Hebrew Israelites, right? All, he all Hebrew Israelites don't believe the same thing. All Hebrew Israelites don't preach the same thing. All Hebrew Israelites don't subscribe to the same doctrines. They argue amongst themselves. That's why they have what? Camps, right? So why should the mm -hmm. comedic community be any different, right? You have within the comedic community, mm -hmm. you have camps. So you need to stop painting the comedic community with this imaginary broad brush that's going to leave you with um, with imaginary uh, conclusions about who and what the comedic community is. Um, I'll give you an example, right? Like, I'm not a metal nature expert. I study it, right? Um, and I really don't, I'm really not too interested, just from my perspective, I'm not too interested in the religious aspect of ancient Kemet. I don't think that that was their real legacy. I think their real legacy for me and, and what I like to study, their real, leg their real legacy was in economics, right? Economics, economics and state planning. Those are the things that I'm interested in. Economics, the origin of money and state planning. I think that the, because it leads to, and I, it, it ultimately, if done correctly, it will lead to business and finance literacy and where you can see your, your, your legacy your historical imprint and your footprint. So that's where that's what I'm interested in, right? So I want to say this: He showed um, Baba Heru, Samaj Pata, um, sitting on in some interview, um, echoing Thomas Manning's, uh, if that's his name, uh, uh, Thomas Manning's uh, theory about the uh, uh, the sexual um, genitalia, the human the human genitalia in reference to the arm. Uh, and what I will say is this, is that there are many people, and for years, many people who um, critique, if you will, um, Baba Heru's perspective on ancient Egypt. Uh, no one is going to quote him as a scholarly source. Not only is no one in the comedic community going to quote him as a scholar, and I love him, and I respect him, and I consider him an elder, but he's not a scholar that I would reference. And not only that, he showed no sources or no sources or references to substantiate what he said about the Ankh. So just because somebody says something and holds up an Ankh and claims to be an ambassador of the comedic community doesn't make it necessarily so because everyone has different standards. Maybe for some people, he will meet their standards. Um, for other people, he won't meet this. For me, I don't meet everybody's standards. You have some clown in the audience who I don't even know um, uh, calling me pseudo. Why? I don't know. But I, I obviously, I don't meet his standards. Then you have other people who, you know, who pay me large sums of money to come and speak for two hours. So, you know, b because I meet their standards. Everybody's at a different place. You know, everybody's at a, at a different place. But we need to be careful when we trump, when, when we bring people out of the club. I don't out of the closet, but when we bring people front and center and say, here, here's one of your representatives saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He, you know, maybe for a small group of people in the comedic community, he is their mentor, their historical mentor. But for far more people in the comedic community, he's not. So there, I don't certainly, I've never thought that the aunt had anything to do with sexual genitalia. But here's the thing. If it did, I would have no problem with it. One of the problems with Hebrew culture is that because it is an immature culture, they have very immature ideas about sex and, and, and sexual expression. So they're uncomfortable about things like speaking about the phallus or speaking about the womb or the vagina. These things are disgusting to them. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of their worldview comes from the Greeks and Greek the Greeks themselves had issues about the human body as most Indo-Europeans would and did. So, but African people don't have those sexual hangups. Dr. Ben spoke about that often. 
about the that was the first, um, that was the first uh, Dr. Ben man. Would you, you say you seen that brother bring that I shit do. out? I they do. came do. from a damn I so called group. I, 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 I got you. I do. Would you? I got you. I did. All right. Sorry. So, um, uh, yeah. So the Hebrew culture is a very immature culture. So when speaking about things of a sexual nature, they're uncomfortable with it. So they have to make jokes about it as. Prodigy Voorhees excellently pointed out. He was like, why are you laughing every time you're speaking about sex? Anytime no, something sexual came out of his mouth, it was always followed by a chuckle, by laughter. That is the sign of someone who has grown old, but has not grown up. If you're grown up, you don't have any issues speaking about sex. If you're speaking, you just don't. Um, and truthfully speaking, what Voorhees, what? or not Voorhees, but what Jerusalem fails to realize is I personally would not have had a problem with his um, uh, 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 connection, connecting of the ankh to sexual genitalia. And I'll tell you why. Because it's very clearly stated in the Predit M. Heru, in the Book of the Dead, um, and also in uh, uh, the Pyramid text, that the ancient Egyptians had very explicit sexual expectations for the afterlife. Why? For the hereafter. Why? Because sex was something they enjoyed on earth. It, to be with a woman was like heaven on earth for a man. And I'm, I presume the same for a woman. For a woman to be with a man, you know, that 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 part of your brain, that hypothalamus is being connected during sex. You're having, you feel like, you know, dopamine release, you feel like it's heaven on earth. So the ancient Egyptians absolutely 100% is documented. They had they had sexual expectations concerning the hereafter. And so if they did connect sexual genitalia to the aunt, which I've seen no documentation that they did, but if they did, I wouldn't have a problem with it. And so I just wanted to say that, and I wanted to give a shout out to um, uh, 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 Voorhees for doing, a, I mean, a, 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 he is a true saber. And um, that's from my perspective. I consider him a, 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 a true saber, a ma'at saber. Absolutely, a true, a true, a true teacher, and I think that um, uh, uh, Jerusalem should actually uh, improve his reading skills and and study better material because if you, it's very easy to come away with poor ideas if you're studying poor material. But if you can't make the distinction between commendable material and poor material, and don't feel bad about that because even I had to outgrow that when I first started. Everything that I was reading wasn't, you know, I wouldn't rececommend. I wouldn't recommend Renu Neche by Raun Nafir Amen to people to read. I wouldn't. There's a whole lot of things written by our master teachers that I wouldn't. I would never recommend Stolen Legacy to anybody. I think it's poor scholarship. For it, 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 it would suffice for its time. But once you know the sources that George G. M. James used, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. And so it's a part of growth. Once you stop growing, you're dead. That's the only time you should stop growing. So if your religion has you so cemented in your thinking that you can't grow, then you're dead while you're alive. And we don't have anything to discuss, you and I. You know, I don't talk to dead people. <laughs> That's not true, I do. I think we all do. I talk to my grandmother all the time. Um, Zerubbabel, would you like to say something now? Hey, I appreciate everybody on the, on the panel, all the judges, um, Chrome TV, that up, uh, Shaka Amos, that up, um, the brother, I can't see, somebody. Uh, the other brother down there, man. Uh, that, uh, and 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 especially um the brother, the brother um uh prodigy Voorhees, man. Especially appreciate that. You know, this is nothing but a discussion for me. You know, you can tell by my name, it, it ain't no skin off my back you know, at all. <laughs> so I appreciate the just the discussion. Yeah, yeah okay. LV Europa, yeah. Shout out to you, bro. Just us, shout out to you. Of course, uh, Ivory Skill, shout out to you. Denise, shout out to you. Yeah. Well, yeah, this was, like I said, this was just my second debate, man. This was, and I just was wrapping it up. I tried to get down two more hours. Somebody said no. <laughs> okay. So with that being said, I thank everyone for coming and blessing my platform. Um, before I leave, um, Brother Crumb, could you pull up the event, the Juneteenth event that's coming up in Atlanta? Brother Crumb has an event that's coming up. 
Um, get your tickets. I got mine. If you're in the Atlanta area or if you can afford to travel, you know, I like dialoguing with everybody in the metal world. But if you guys could come out, please do so. Um, and if you can't pull it up, I'll make sure that I keep posting it to my Facebook and everything. Sister, Sister, Sister I'm, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna let this is this is prodigy. I'm gonna let the brother uh, Crumb go ahead and um, and 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 get out the information, and then I'll go ahead and uh, and uh, and then close out as well. As Ruba Bell did. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, prodigy. I'm no, so no, sorry. no, 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 no. It's all good. It's all good. I'm going mute, and I'm gonna let the brother uh, go ahead and and, and uh, you know get the information out to the people. Juneteenth just became a yes. national holiday last year. I did my first one last year, sold out. It was very posh, very nice, uh, beautiful energy, lots of beautiful people. We all dressed up, very fancy, catered event. No, no, I'm sorry. We had a chef, uh, you know, live in the kitchen. So the Juneteenth luncheon lecture Saturday, June 18th from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. right here in Atlanta, Georgia. You can get your tickets at crumbtv.info forward slash events. That's crumbtv.info slash events. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, I definitely want to give a shout out uh, to Information Age. Thank you for putting on this debate. Thank you, Sister Ivory. Uh, thank you, Denise, for hosting um, this debate. Um, I also want to say thank you to uh, Crumb TV. Thank you, brother, for being open and honest and not biased. Um, thank you to the brother Just Us for being open and honest and not biased. My brother LV, it's been a minute. Yeah, I see, man. I see you got rid of the locks, brother. <laughs> man, a, you know, it's yeah, all. I, man. I, I see you, man. I see you, man. You over there on your R&B tip. I see you, brother. Thank you, man, for being open and honest and not biased. Uh, brother Shaka, almost. Hey, listen, brother, whether you know it or not, man, um, I've been a student of yours for a long time, brother. So, you know, hearing hearing, hearing uh, those words come from you, uh, um, you know, means a lot, brother. So thank you. I, I really, I really appreciate that, man. That means a lot to me. Uh, shout out Ampu Crew, the squad. Shout out Team My Op, the squad. Um, listen, I, I've been in this community, um, you know, as far as the information goes, since 2007. So I've, I've, I've been doing this for um, um, a while now. Um, also, shout out to brothers like Asar M Hotel, um, Jawu, a lot of brothers in the community um, that's bringing forth this information. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you for everybody, especially all those who out there watching who took the time and energy to watch the debate. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, man. And um, I appreciate the love and respect. And uh, I'm going to end it like that, man. Hotel. Hey, Prodigy, All I want right. you to do that PowerPoint on Crumb TV. <laughs> Absolutely, brother. Let's uh man, let's get it. Let's uh let's uh put something together, brother, and uh and we'll make it happen. Hey yes, brother, I, I definitely want to say something to Prodigy Voorhees because it's been a while. And um I remember uh this argument, but this one is more refined and it just shows the growth that you've experienced, bro. So I just want to tip my hat to you, man. And I'm going to be on Crumb TV in the classroom, too, watching that breakdown. That's, get that right. Right. That's right, brother. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, I definitely like to get on my show as well. So I can see how we can, how I can push you a little further with that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I see you, Jess. Us. All righty. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And see you next time. Crumb TV.